when I met Zoe, we were going to a Christian school. Growing up kind of as a kid, God was the first thing in my life that I cared about. The, and I went into this phase of if this is what I'm getting for my effort to be a good Christian, then I'm just going to go full force into going and getting what I want. My relationship with God at the time was very strained. I was going through a really rough time with um, depression. I struggled with pornography a lot and I just accepted I don't know how to change myself and I prayed about it and God won't change me to make me stop doing it and so I just continued. I had a lot of mixed emotions about my relationship with Sam. He was actually pretty honest right up at front and told me he was struggling with pornography. I was very naive about a lot of things and didn't know how it would translate to real life relationships. Starting out in our relationship with Zoe, I was pressuring her more and more to be more and more physical. I was very hesitant because of how I was raised. I kind of wanted to save everything till marriage and yet at the time I was going through such a crisis of faith and everything that as I got to know Sam more and became more attached and more in love and everything, I went more with what I might desire as opposed to what I knew was right. So it was spring of my senior year, spring of Zoe's junior year. Right. She was 20 and I was 21. And in mid-February, we um, found out, that, found out that I was pregnant. I dropped out of college to go plan for the wedding. We got married that June. The transition from college life, sleeping in and staying up late and having a community of friends, to living with Zoe's parents, having a newborn baby, and me needing to look for a job and all of this was just disorienting. I was still coping with all of the shame and all of the guilt of getting pregnant without being married. And um, I was diagnosed with uh, postpartum depression. Very shortly after Mariel was born, um, I decided to go to this group at Dolner Hospital for moms who were struggling with depression and anxiety. And um, while I was there, um, I actually met a woman who went to Chapel Street, and she invited us to her small group. It was a lot of young people who were young parents with kids. I'm like, awesome, this is what we need. We could feel some hope, some more hope. My main coping mechanism continued to be pornography and keeping secrets from Zoe. And I hit that point of, I've finally taken it too far, and I made a decision that I was going to just go tell Zoe my anxiety was spiking a lot, and because Chapel Street had been such a great resource in the past and a really wonderful place that we felt comfortable, I started asking around and I found the Bright Hope Care Group, and it was definitely a wonderful resource and definitely a community that I felt God was working through and that it was a safe place to talk about issues that were hard to talk about. When we started going to Chapel Street, I think at one point in time Jeff said, I don't think most of you, your problem is that there's some horrendous sin that you need to stop doing. And that kind of immediately connected with me, like, well, that's how I identify myself. There's this thing that I want to stop doing that I can't. And that's how I see myself and how I see that God sees me and how I think other people see me. And he said, I don't think that's, that's your problem. Your problem is that you don't see yourself the way God sees you. I was definitely in a, an extremely shameful place where everything that I'd been doing was now revealed. What I continued to hear was that healing was going to come by revealing more. And eventually through Compass being there over time, I rediscovered my genuine desire that I had to do the right thing, to have a relationship with God, and to be done with all the sin that I've been living in. My depression and anxiety and past scars really kind of undermined what I knew to be true, that I was loved and that you know God saved me and that he really wants the best for me. And you know, God is using care groups. We can show each other God's love and give each other our support and also to um, watch each other grow. And it's, it's really a special thing.
Wow. Yeah. I know Sam and Zoe, and I'm so grateful for what God's done in their life and for the courage they had to tell their story. And perhaps their courage and you hearing their story would encourage you or someone you know. And so once again, before we jump into this morning's sermon, if, that's, if that connects with you in some way, if you feel like you're struggling alone and we can serve you and help you find freedom and help through care ministries, please stop one of us after the service or in the, at the welcome desk or, or call the church office this week because, again, you're not a number to God. He sees and he knows what you're struggling with and he wants to bring people around you to help you. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father in heaven, thank you for stories like Sam and Zoe's. You're always at work, and we're never alone, even though we sometimes feel like it. And we ask now that you, Lord Jesus, the living word made flesh, would speak to us through your written word, because we need to hear. We pray it in your name. Amen. How many of you are list makers? Yeah? How many of you list makers have ever written something down after you did it just to cross it off and feel good about yourself? That's a sign that you need a care group, right? A support group. No, we don't have a group for that. That's a different kind of thing. Right. Or, or uh, maybe are you like, how many of you are record keepers? Like you keep meticulous records of everything. Anybody do that, you know? When I was a kid, I used to score baseball games in the record book. I loved to do that. I had my baseball cards. I memorized all the stats and the numbers. I'd clothespin them to clotheslines. That's old school technology for you. And for the batting order of the Cubs. And so we keep track of things, all kinds of things. Lately, I've been keeping closer track of uh, the number of calories that I eat. Uh, when I, I didn't count them ever, uh, uh, for 10 years I didn't care, but now I'm counting them. Right? I'm worried about it, right? So, so we keep track of calories, our bank accounts, sports statistics. How many of you have ever kept track of the words you speak in a day? Anybody? Anybody keep a journal of every word you say for a day, for six hours? How many words would it be? If you were to keep track just for a day, let's not get crazy, a whole, a whole day, keep track of your words, how many words do you think the average person, not, you know, talking heads like pastors, but the, the average person, how, how many words would it be? 16,000 words a day for the average person. 16,000 words a day. That's enough words to fill 132 books of 200 pages each in one year's time. That's a lot of words. It's a lot of talking. What are we saying with all these words? What are our, all of our many words accomplishing? Is it all just empty talk? Or is anything being produced? Does, do your words really matter? Your words matter more than you can imagine. And part of, I think, our issue in thinking about this and not keeping track and we say things without thinking about it is because we live in a culture where there's an abundance of words. I mean, words are everywhere. You are bombarded every day, all day, by people talking to you and at you. By words. Teachers, coaches, bosses, coworkers, family members, pastors, right? Just words, 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 words. But your words matter so much more than you can imagine. Jesus in Matthew chapter 12 tells us, this is a sobering passage, that there's going to come a day, judgment day, in chapter 12, verse 36, when you will have to give an account of every careless word you've spoken. Think about that. You might not be counting or keeping track, but apparently God is, and someday we're going to have to give an account of every careless word. Does that unsettle you at all? Does that make you feel a little uncomfortable? It does me. How many of you have ever had this experience in your life? Something you said in the past is brought up in the present, and it's not good. It's used to bite you, right? Has that ever happened to anybody? Every married person should have their hand up, right? <laughs> Are we still talking about that? Yes, honey, we're still talking about that, right? Am I ever going to live that down? No, you're never going to live that down, right? <laughs> Apparently, our words matter, and God is keeping track. Jesus does not say this to make you feel scared or guilty or bad, but to warn us and to impress on us how much our words matter. This is the power of words. The power of words. Now, for those of you who know the story of the Bible, this shouldn't be all that surprising. God's story, which we're a part of in Christ, how did this world start? How did it start? In the beginning, God, what? Said, let there be light. And there was light. And the lights came on. The, everything began at God's word, and we're told that all things hold together by a word of his power. That's the Lord Jesus. You, the molecules of your body are held together by a word of his power. 
Jesus is called the living word made flesh. This is our story. God has hardwired the power of words into the universe, and that means into your mind and heart and mind, because we're part of it. We're made by him as well. Words matter more than we think. Talk is not cheap. How many of you still carry around in your mind and heart certain words spoken to you? Anybody? Yeah, for good and for bad. Genesis chapter 1, God speaks and things happen. In fact, if you've never done this, a good exercise in Bible study for you, if you're new to Bible study, take your Bible, if you have one, and and go home and take a pen or a highlighter and just go through and read Genesis 1 and 2 and underline or highlight every time the Bible says, and God said. Just highlight it. And then go through and look at what comes right after God said. I'll tell you what happens. Whatever God said is what happens after God said it, right? God speaks and things happen. Words are the means that God uses to bring life and blessing into the world. Words are the means God uses to bring life and blessing into the world and into your life. In Genesis 1, 28, God said, be fruitful and multiply, and he blessed them. Proverbs 18, verse 21 tells us that the tongue has the power of life and death, and all who love it will eat its fruits. Death and life from the power of the tongue. Now, you might think, that's hyperbole. I mean, maybe for God that's true, but my words don't have the power of life and death. Actually, in a sense, they do. Genesis 1, God said and created there's life. In Genesis 3, there are some other words spoken by someone who's not God, the enemy, the adversary, the serpent, Satan, who uses lies and corrupting words to distort God's word to do what? Let his words get into our mind and heart so we believe the lie, the deceitful words, and it brings death. The power of words is hardwired in the universe. We all carry around words of life and death spoken into us and over us. By the way, this is why you can't take back certain words once they are spoken. Right? You know the story of old Isaac in the Bible? He's got two sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau is the red-faced, hairy one who likes to hunt and be out in the fields. And Jacob is the smooth-skinned mama's boy who stayed at home in the tents. And they had, they're twins, but they have some issues. It's a dysfunctional family. Maybe you can relate. Anyway, um, the birthright, the blessing, comes from Isaac, who's old and bl- half-blind and dying, to the oldest son. But Jacob and, and mom, let's talk about dysfunction, trick their, their father and her husband into thinking he's Esau. And he gives the blessing. But then later he figures out that he was duped. Have you ever wondered, why doesn't old Isaac, when he realizes the whole thing was a ruse, just say, oh, I take it all back, bring in Esau, I'll give him the blessing. Why did he take it back? Because to the biblical worldview, you can't take it back. Once it's spoken, it's spoken. It goes out from your mouth into that person's mind and heart. And you know this is true in the negative, don't you? Have you, how many of you ever said something, and as you're saying it, you realize, I should not be saying this? Or as soon as you say it, oh, I wish I could take those words. Oh, no, words are coming out. You know, like you can't stop it. And you instantly know this was a mistake. I, I, I've hurt somebody. I wish with all my heart I could take those words back. And we say things like, just kidding. I didn't mean it. I take it back. Does that ever, has that ever in the history of humanity worked? I was just kidding. You can say it, but the words have gone out. And they've got into, and they're beginning to do their work. That's what we're being told here in the Bible. Words have power. Let's not be careless with our words. And the Bible says this doesn't only work negatively, it also works positively. When you speak words of life and blessing, and those too have power in people's lives. My youngest son, Benjamin, we take him up to a camp where he's going to spend a gap year, uh, drop him off this afternoon. He grew up in the, kind of the shadow of his older brother and sister who were high achievers, and he struggled with that for a while. And I remember, I, I said a lot of things I regret, many, many things. As a dad, I've made a lot of mistakes with my words. But one thing I said to him when he was wrestling through kind of identity, we all go through that. I said, I already have a Noah and a Hannah. What I want is a Benji. And he's repeated that probably, I don't know, more times than I can count. Those words, I didn't realize the power of them, went out and into his mind and heart, and it had impact on him over the years. So it works both ways, the Bible tells us. The blessing of words. I want to talk about the blessing of words. Once spoken, your words have more power than you realize. 
You have the power and ability from God to bless other people with your words. I don't mean to make them feel good in the moment. I mean to speak something into their life that actually has, produces something, has transformative power. Do you believe that about yourself? Do you believe that your words have the God-given ability to bless another person, to change them, to transform them? Maybe you believe that about other people's words. Maybe you think, well, my words aren't that significant. It's not true. This is why the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only what is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Think about that. Leave that up there for a minute. What if just for this week, we all decided I'm going to do that? For one week of my life, I'm going to say nothing except what builds people up. No corrupting talk, no deceitful talk, no self-serving talk, not try to spin any conversation in my direction, not talk bad about anybody, not disparage anybody with my words. I'm only going to say things that build people up and give grace. How different would your marriage be this week if that's all you said? How different would your family be? Would our schools be? Think of all the bullying. If only thing we said was to bless, build up, and give grace. And everything else, I'm swallowing that. Not saying it. I'm going to confess it. This is, it's, if you think about it, I've been pondering it this week. It's staggering to think about. It. It's profoundly difficult. You ever tried it? The best I could ever manage is maybe a couple hours of not saying the worst stuff. It's easy to say. It's hard to do. But what if we took God's word seriously and said, okay, I'm going to live that way. I'm going to live that way. When, and when you're around somebody who's talking in, in a way that is corrupting or is deceitful or is disparaging, you just don't engage. Years ago, I used to be a volunteer football coach in a, in a, in a community I live in. And the coaches sometimes, when you get into the coach's locker room, they don't, they don't always use the best words, <laughs> if I'd be honest with you. And they would talk badly about players and their wives and, and they just, just course. And so I, I didn't really want to engage, but I felt kind of awkward, so I decided I'm going to try to experiment. I'm going to say kind of the opposite stuff. I'm going to say, like, how great the day was, how, much that, how great that player is, how much I love my wife. And they looked at me like I was a space alien, you know, like, because like, <laughs> it's just so unusual. We don't practice Ephesians 4.29, but what if we did? We live in a world, friends, that is starving for words of blessing, for real words of blessing. There's words of cursing everywhere you look. Here's the thing, though. You can't bless yourself. With apologies to all the positive self-talk gurus in our world today. I mean, you can do something. It works to a point. But you can't, at the soul level, bless yourself. Words must be spoken into you and over you from outside of you. You, 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 know, you know the old Stuart Smalley sketch on Saturday Night Live? Look in the mirror. I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. And doggone it, people like me. Right? I've tried. It doesn't work. Right? <laughs> You need someone outside of you whose authority you believe in to speak words of blessing into you and over you. And this is what God does. This is what God has done, is doing, and will do in your life in Jesus Christ. He speaks. In fact, there's a crazy verse in Hebrews that says the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We don't have time to get into all that. He's the better word of grace, of love into your life. This is what God does. And I want to show you just what this blessing is with the time we have left. I want to show you, and I, I, was, I took a, 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 on about Thursday afternoon, I, I rewrote the entire sermon because I felt like God was pushing a different direction here. I wasn't going to talk to you about how do you bless other people and give you practical tips, but I feel like what God wants you to hear is how you are blessed by his words. So if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to the, uh, the Old Testament book of Numbers. Uh, if you don't have your Bible, there's a giant screen, and I've got mine, and we'll, we'll read it anyway. Numbers chapter 6. This is known as the Aaronic blessing. Not ironic, but Aaronic. Uh, Aaron the priest, the great high priest, speaking these words, because God instructs him to, over God's people. And I want you to see, as we read this and unpack it, how God speaks these words into and over your life in Jesus today. Let's, 
Let me read it, verse 22. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Someday, we're going to have to do like a six or eight week whole series on this, these verses by themselves. But for today, I just want to walk through this briefly. The first thing to notice is that this blessing comes from where? Where? It's not a trick question. God! Aaron speaks it. Moses speaks to Aaron and tells him what to say. There's instructions given. But the origin of these words comes from God. This is important. It's a specific blessing that God said, say exactly these words to my people, over my people. God wrote this for you, his children, if you're in Jesus Christ. These are his words to you, over you. That's really important. This is not Hallmark card sentimentality. You always mean so much more to me than you could ever guess. Because you fill my life with love and happiness. Blah, blah, blah. Right? You know, the stuff we read on the cards, you know. This is so nice. People read it and throw it in the garbage, right? Or, or it's not even like human encouragement that we invent in our own heads. You know, like, you know, you do, you're so great. You did a great job. Now you smell nice. You have good personal hygiene, whatever we say. Like, you just, we just <laughs> say things to each other. And that can be encouraging and make you feel good for a moment. This is something much deeper and much more profound. These are the words of the God of the universe who made you in his image that he specifically wants you to hear as his people. And we're told that this is God's name. At the end of the blessing, God says, so shall my name be upon the people. In receiving this blessing, you become people of his name. Do you notice, put the passage up there again. You'll see the Lord. You know how the Lord is in all caps there? Anytime, you, some of you know this, you've done some Bible study, but if you're new to this, in the Old Testament, when you see the word Lord, capital L, small O-R-D, that's the word uh, El, El Shaddai, Adonai, it's a different word. Whenever you see this word, L-O-R-D in all caps, it's the Hebrew reference to God's sacred name, Yahweh, spoken to Moses in Mount Sinai, the burning bush. It's his personal name. Why is that important? This is a personal blessing. Spoken by a personal God who knows your name and wants you to know him by name. People of his name. People who are known by name. This is not God absent kind of in the clouds saying some obscure things. It's very personal. And I hope you receive it that way this morning. The Lord, we'll look and pick it up here, verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. This is the Hebrew phrase, yevarechacha. It's fun to say. Yevarechacha. It, it's the, um, it, the blessing is, is the image of a king stooping down to give a great gift to a, a lowly servant, or, or a father bending low to give a gift of great significance to his child. It has to do with favor, kindness, the special place that you hold in God's heart. Yevarechacha, God blesses you, stoops low to bless you. And the word keep you is a Hebrew phrase, veish merecha. It, it means protection, holding close, shielding, guarding. So the blessing of God in your life is that he loves you so much, he comes to your level to give you a great gift, and that's the Lord Jesus and his grace. And he keeps you, protects you, shields you, guards you. I think part of our issue in not receiving the blessing God wants to give us is that we're trying to keep it all together and we forget he's the one who keeps you. He keeps you. He holds you together. And you're trying to keep it all together. Moms, I know that you're, some of you moms here, you're just trying to keep it all together. And you can't. It's beyond your pay grade. The Lord keeps you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keeps you. He holds you together and keeps you when it feels like everything is flying apart. That's his blessing to you. We could stop there and it'd be enough, wouldn't it? The Lord favors you, smiles on you, cares about you, gives good gifts to you, and keeps you and will keep you. But it doesn't stop there. 
How often do we miss out on the blessing of God keeping us because we're trying to keep ourselves? God has blessed you. He is blessing you, and he will bless you. God has kept you. He is keeping you, and he will keep you. Verse 25 says, The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. This is my favorite part. This is incredible. The face of God. What does this mean? You know what this means in your own human experience. You look into the faces of those you love, right? It's awkward to make eye contact with people that you don't know, unless you're just creepy, right? To stare at people that you don't know. Look, find somebody near you that you don't know that well and just stare at them for 30 seconds. Ready? Go. Ready? Turn to them and just go. <laughs> How long can you last? You're not doing it. I'm waiting. <laughs> what? It's weird. But if you know somebody, turn to someone you love. Now look at them. Go ahead. It's different, isn't it? I remember when I was dating Erin when, when we were in college, my wife now, and I wanted to catch a glimpse of her. And I wanted her to see if she made eye contact with me. Uh, and then she, we look away, we look back, is she still looking? Right, you do that sort of thing. And when you have a child, don't you moms and dads do this? You, try, you just look in their face, you beam on them, you look at them. And you go, and you wonder, is it gas or are they smiling at me? I don't know what that is, <laughs> right? You just stare, you want to look into the face of the people that you love. Think about what this blessing is saying. God of the universe, make his face shine on you. God's face is toward you, not away from you. And you know what it's like when someone turns their face away, don't you? When you desperately want to have their attention, to speak to them, to have them look at you, and they turn away from you. The, the blessing of God is that he's going to bless you with great gifts. He's keeping you, and his face of love is shining on you. It's toward you. He's looking at you. Don't look away. Don't look away from him. Because he looks at you and loves you. In Psalm 27, verse 9, the psalmist says, Don't hide your face from me, O Lord. Why would he say that? Because sometimes in our sin, we're the ones who turn away, aren't we? We're the ones, don't look at me. Because we're aware of our own. I've said this many, many times in sermons and with different people, but I'm going to ask you again because it's so important because we get it wrong. What do you think God thinks of you? What do you think God thinks of you? You don't have to answer out loud, but I want you to answer in your own mind and heart. When God thinks of you, which he does all the time, what are his thoughts about you? Most of you, if you're honest, think something like, I'm kind of a screw-up, he loves me, but... I'm a work in progress, I, I, um, I gotta get this right, I'm messed up over here. Like your mind goes immediately to things you aren't doing or should do or should stop doing. Like Sam in the video, right? That's how he thought of himself. That's not what God thinks of you. That's what you think of you. And the best example, though it's imperfect, is a parent to a child, moms and dads. You know all about your kids' idiocy, right? You know about the dumb things they do. But that's not how you think of them. You love them. You don't think of them like that. You think of my boy, my girl, my precious one. That's close to what we're being told here is the blessing of God. God knows about your screw-ups and your hang-ups and your brokenness. He knows. But that's not how he thinks of you. That's not how he looks at you. He looks at you if you're in Christ and you're his beloved son, his beloved daughter, and his face shines with love on you. It's hard to believe, isn't it? God, I... I just pray right now that you'd give us a spirit of understanding because we struggle with this. I know I do. To believe that's true. That because of Jesus, you're smiling and shining. Your face is toward us. Help us to believe that. Amen. We don't deserve this. We don't earn it. But this is what God gives us, who he is. This is the blessing he wants to pour out over you. In verse 26 then. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, the same Hebrew root word is the word face, panav, and give you peace. The Lord lift up his countenance. This is the image in my head of when you grab the kid's face and you lift it up, right? You do that, moms and dads? So one time, my son Benjamin was trying to get my attention because I wasn't paying attention, and he grabbed my face. Dad, look at me, you know, I'm talking to you. This is God lifting up your face so you see him. Sometimes we can be uncomfortable with his gaze, but don't look away. And then he says, and give you peace. It is the face of the Lord that brings you the peace of the Lord. I'll say that again. 
It's the shining, loving, gracious face of the Lord that gives you the shalom, the peace of the Lord. That's the Hebrew word, shalom. It doesn't just mean the absence of conflict. It means the presence of God in your life in the midst of conflict. Jesus says this. Jesus says in John 14, my peace I give to you. I leave my peace with you. But I do not give as the world gives. You know when he says that? What does he mean? This is not a peace. This is not circumstantial peace. This is not like when the election goes the way you want it, then you'll have peace. When the economy goes the way you want it, then you'll have peace. That stuff comes and goes. Jesus says, I'm not offering you that. That's fleeting, and it doesn't last, and it doesn't change you. I'm offering you shalom, wholeness, harmony, completeness in me that you can have even when the world around you is up for grabs. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. What that means is when you look in the face of God and you know he loves you, you can have shalom in your heart because you know that whatever's happening out there, I'm loved. Nothing can change that. Nothing can take it away. This is the blessing of God for his people. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and the Lord give you peace. Most of us think a blessing means get a job, heal this person, change this relationship, fix my circumstances, and those are things you can pray about and you should. But it's not the primary blessing God wants to give you. He wants to give you something far greater than changing your circumstances. He wants to give you himself and his love. Now, here's the trick. This blessing is something we're challenged to live in light of. So we need to hear it all the time. In fact, I'm going to read it to you and say it to you in Hebrew. My Hebrew is terrible, but you wouldn't know. <laughs> and I want you to hear it as God's people. Yevarechacha Adonai, ve'ish miracha, ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'hunika, yisan Adonai panav elecha v'asem lacha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. Here's the great news as we close here. You're not only called to live in light of this and to believe it, which is a lifelong journey, isn't it, to believe this and live like this is true about me. You're also called to extend it that the blessing of God comes to you and passes through you. Remember your words, Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only what is useful for building people up. That God's blessing, because these things are true of you, you can be a conduit to speak words of life into other people. To remind them of God's love for them in Christ if they're a believer. To tell them of God's love for them if they're not, and, and to encourage them to consider how much he loves them. To serve, people say, you know, Preach the gospel, whatever you do, and if necessary, use words. Sometimes attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, which is not true. He never said that, but anyway. Um, that's ridiculous. You can't preach the gospel without words. I think we should, our words should line up with our actions, but you can't speak the gospel without words. We live in a culture of words. This is the story of words. God's a God of words, and his word is spoken in your life, and he wants you to speak those kinds of words to each other. So I want to close by doing this very thing speaking words of blessing and life into a particular group of people. It's a little bit of a risk. We don't always do this. But if, uh, it's the beginning of a school year. Many of you are just back to school, and you're so excited, I can tell. <laughs> Some of your moms are like, I really am. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're an educator, a teacher, a nurse, a coach, an administrator, a principal, a paraprofessional, if you're a lunch lady, or if you serve in any way in private or public schools in the education of the children of this community, I'd like for you to stand, because I want to bless you. Would you stand up if you, if you serve our, our children, our students? Yeah, we don't always get recognized, and it's a brand new year. And so now, this is a little bit uh, of a risk as well. Those of you that are facing them or toward them, I want you just to extend a hand toward them, because you're, we're all going to bless them together. I'll speak the words, and you extend a hand, Okay. Let's bow, and I want you teachers and educators and workers to hear these words. Father in heaven, we thank you for all these men and women who work to educate and to serve the children and students of our community, our children. We pray for your peace and protection and covering over them for this whole year. We thank you in advance for all that you have in store 
And we ask you that you would unfold great blessings on their life, in their classrooms, in their schools, and in their homes. That this year ahead be remembered as the year that you blessed greatly. Give them your wisdom. Give them your eyes to see each child and student as you see them. Give them laughter and joy in every day. And in the moments when they feel worn out or unappreciated, remind them that they do not just represent a school or a district. They represent you. So fill them with your peace. Bless them and keep them. And bless our children and students through them. Love them, shine on them, pour out your blessing and favor over them throughout this entire year. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Now let's all stand. You can stay standing, teachers, and the rest of you stand. And I want to give you the blessing that has been given to God's people down through the generations and centuries and then send you on your way today. Put your hands like this to receive it. Ready? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. Amen.